Well, this is a well-loved and well-known story, is it not? I have to say, this is one of those Bible stories that I think captured my imagination even as an elementary school child in Sunday school. It's, it's one of those vivid scenes that I remember them telling us the story with those little figures they put on the felt boards. Remember those little felt boards in Sunday school with the little cutouts? Anybody remember those? Is it just me? I might have had a budget church. I don't know. <laughs> But it's such a, it's such a, a vivid thing to, to imagine Jesus coming by and the disciples who were fishing. And I remember even one time getting in a little trouble when I was in fifth grade Sunday school. Because there's a, a, a little line in here that always struck me as funny. It says that Peter and Andrew were throwing nuts into the sea because they were fishermen. And as the teacher was reading that one section, I, as a fifth grader, sometimes lacks a filter, said, well, duh. Why else would they be throwing nuts into the sea? Thank you for the laugh. No one else laughed. It might not even be funny. It just strikes me as funny, as if I was preaching, for I am a preacher. It's not like they would say they were throwing fishermen, fishing nets into the sea because they were carpenters. Wouldn't have made any sense. Nothing? They didn't laugh then either, it's okay. <laughs> but it does capture our imagination. And it is one of those foundational stories of the Gospels. I remember it being always lesson one when I was in confirmation and when I've taught confirmation since then. That we began our Christian life by hearing Jesus' call to follow me. And then we do. You're sitting here today because at some point in your life, you've heard Jesus call to you and say, follow me. And in some way, whether it be dramatic or still and quiet, you dropped whatever you were doing to follow Jesus. This is how we begin our story of discipleship. I even have these little fish hook pens that I got when I was in youth group and was on a youth mission trip. And we were sent back to fish for people and had the little fish hooks to remember. Follow me, the invitation. It's so simple that a small child can understand it. That invitation to follow me occurs 21 times throughout the Gospels. 21 times. And every time Jesus says, follow me, he's expecting some sort of response. Some kind of decisive action. Jesus invites people to follow him and expects them to respond. And so we hear today Peter and Andrew, James and John, dropping their fishing nets and going to fish for people. But if you really stop and think about it, if you move beyond the familiarity and the simplicity of the story that we know so well, we might even start to tune out a little bit when we start hearing it again. We discover really how radical and challenging this call story is in Matthew's Gospel. The, I mean, these four men dropped everything. They were fishermen. They had their nets, and they dropped them and followed Jesus. What would the equivalent thing be for us? What does it mean for us to drop our nets and to follow Jesus? Are we supposed to quit our jobs and go run off and do something else? Are all of us who are disciples of Jesus called to leave our families behind? I mean, these were young men. And all of us are in different places in life. All of us have different kinds of nets, some more nets than others. This call is no small thing. Surely it's not for everyone. I don't know about you, but I feel more like well, that story a little bit later in the Gospels. And that rich young ruler who hears the same invitation. You can follow me. But before he said, follow me, first you need to go and sell all you have and give to the poor. And the rich young ruler walked away sad because he had many possessions. And that invitation to follow Jesus was simply costing him too much. 
But then I remember, even the disciples who are willing to drop everything and follow Jesus, even though they said yes and they followed, didn't end up much better off. No sooner than they start following that they start misunderstanding what Jesus is all about. And they fall on their face over and over again, trying to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And then when they get to the cross, when following Jesus is going to really start costing them something, we see them betray Jesus and deny that they even knew Jesus or otherwise completely abandon him. Follow me may be simple to understand, but that doesn't mean that it's easy for any of us. Christian theologian Stanley Hauerweiss writes about this passage. He says, we're still in the early stages of Matthew's story, but we're already beginning to see what is required if we are to be followers rather than admirers of Jesus. And that's a key distinction we see throughout the gospel. Jesus drew these enormous crowds, but he had relatively few disciples. And we too love to see the miracles. We're inspired by his teachings and the way he challenged people in their religious life. We long to experience the healing touch of Jesus in our own lives. We're moved deeply when we see him reach out and touch the lepers and others who were untouchable or stand by the woman caught in adultery against those who would stone her. And as aspired as we are, seldom many of us ever find the courage to go and do likewise. Stanley Hauerwas later tells the story about Clarence Jordan. Clarence is one of my heroes. He is the founder of the Koinonia community, which he founded back in the late 40s, early 50s. It was an interracial farm in the middle of South Georgia, which at the time was illegal. And it was a radical vision of God's kingdom that he was living out there and continues to live out as the Koinonia community continues. And in the early 50s, it was said that Clarence asked his brother, Robert Jordan, who was an attorney and who would later be a state senator and a justice on the Supreme Court in Georgia, he asked his brother Robert to represent Koinonia legally. And Robert, his brother, replied, Clarence, I can't do that. You know my political aspirations. If I represented you, I might lose my job. And if I lost my job, I would lose my house and everything that I've got. And Clarence replied, well, we might lose everything too, Bob. And Bob said, well, it's different for you. Well, Clarence said, why is it different? I remember it seems to me that you and I joined the church on the same Sunday. And I expect when we came forward, the preacher asked me the same question he asked you. He asked me, do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And I said, yes. What did you say? And Bob said, well, I follow, Clar I follow Jesus, Clarence, up to a point. Well, could that point by any chance be the cross? Yeah, that's right. I follow him to the cross, but not on the cross. I'm not going to get crucified. And Clarence said, then I don't believe you're a disciple. You're an admirer of Jesus, but you're no disciple of his. I think you ought to go back to the church that you belong to and tell him you're an admirer of Jesus, but not a disciple. Bob said, well now, Clarence, if everyone who felt like I do did that, we wouldn't have a church anymore, would we? The question, that question, the question Clarence said was, well, maybe you don't even have a church now. And there's not a lot of forgiveness between brothers, is there? That's tough. And every time I read this passage and I realize the radical discipleship that Christ calls us to, I'm led down this path to the example of people like Clarence Jordan who really did drop some nets and follow Jesus and paid a heavy, heavy price for it in the face of racial segregation. But as big of a hero as he is of mine, if I was to talk to Clarence Jordan, if I was his brother and he said these words to me, 
I would be humbled, but I would have to disagree with them. I'd have to say, yeah, Clarence, actually, we do have a church. And we have a church not because we have a whole lot of people gathered together who've got it all right and have sacrificed all in their life and are the perfect example of discipleship. No, we have a church because of God's grace. We have a church because God is patient with each of us. That God is kind and understanding and forgiving. And we who are gathered as the church are all different kinds of places in our spiritual lives and few of any of us is ready to crawl up on that cross with Jesus and be crucified. But that doesn't mean that God has turned away from us yet. Or at all. Or ever. That the good news that I hear in the gospel today, even as Jesus says, follow me, is that he doesn't just ask once. But it's an invitation that comes to us each and every day. And no matter how many times we failed to actually follow, or how many times we followed our own way, or how many times we listened to another voice and followed it for a while instead, God has never turned his back on us. Jesus continues to meet us where we are. And thank God is convicted and, con and committed to making sure we don't stay there. Even now, perhaps even despite ourselves, Jesus is still calling you and still calling me to follow. Last week, Ruth reminded us that we all have a vocation, that we all have a calling. From that passage in John, Jesus is asked, where are you staying? And he replies, come and see. Well, the only way that we can come and see where Jesus is staying and where Jesus is calling us is to actually get up and follow. And where he leads us is going to be different for each of us. And I'm sure there's plenty of testimony and witness, even in this own congregation, of times in your life where you have answered that call in a new way. I know in my life within the church and ministry, I've come across many people who not in some dramatic way, but in their own quiet way, have found a way to follow Jesus and take the next step. In the first church where I worked as a youth director, there was a church secretary. And she did the things lots of church secretaries do, or an administrative assistant around the church, but she was also in charge of putting together the prayer list every week. She made sure that the pastors knew who was in the hospital and, and who needed to see a visit coming home from surgery, but the list was so long of people she knew the pastors would never have a chance to go and see. People who maybe weren't quite as sick or who maybe just got the flu for a little bit, but because of their place in life, they would be isolated when they couldn't get out of their homes. And she felt convicted, and in seeing all of these people and knowing who they were and wishing there was some way to reach out to them, she heard Jesus say, follow me. And behind the scenes, she worked and she put together a lay visitation program. She found some volunteers in the church and she trained them. And it wasn't Stephen's Ministries, which is a great ministry where you go to people who are in crisis situations. This was just for people who just needed a friend for that day or who needed someone to bring them some cough syrup, or just a visit to let them know that even though they might have missed church the last couple Sundays, they're still remembered. It was such a simple way, and yet no one else had done it. It was radical discipleship on its own terms. Jesus said, follow me, and she followed. Just a couple weeks ago, I met a woman at a church meeting who is a hairstylist, of all things. Now, I've got to tell you, if you're a hairstylist, you know more about people in the community than Ruth and I will ever know about your lives combined. <laughs> and by the way, if you use Ruthie Young as your hairstylist, maybe we will eventually find out more than you would ever tell us, too. She said she'd never divulge, but we're working on her. This wasn't Ruthie. This was another woman in a, in a nearby community. And the reason she was at this church meeting is... She wasn't going to quit her job as a hairstylist. She loved it. That's what she knew how to do, and that's how she made money. But she is in recovery. Six years of recovery from being an alcoholic. 
And one of the things she discovered over time is how many of her clients are also in recovery. She heard all of these stories of people's children who are substance abusers or in and out of rehab. How many of her clients' grandchildren are struggling with addiction? And it just kept weighing on her and kept weighing on her and kept weighing on her. In the middle of all of that, she heard Jesus say, follow me. And she was there to learn how to do a recovery ministry in the church where she attends. There's countless stories like this of people who heard Jesus say, follow me. And they were willing to stand up and take that next step. See, I think that's where, it, particularly for those of us who have been in the church for so long, and it's just out of habit, and it's a good habit to have that we come and we're a part of the church. But I think sometimes we forget that we're here because we're supposed to be following Jesus each and every day. Jim Harnish, who is a retired United Methodist pastor who led Hyde Park United Methodist Church in Tampa for 25 years, always loves telling the story from Alice in Wonderland. He said, do you remember Alice's conversation with the Cheshire cat during her journey through Wonderland? When she came to a fork in the road, she asked, would you tell me please which way I ought to go from here? The cat replied, that depends a good deal on where you want to get to. And she said, I don't much care where. And the cat replied, well, then it doesn't matter which way you go. He tells that story because he has encountered plenty of Christians who at some point quit paying attention to where they were going. Or even worse, quit caring where they were going. Who quit asking Jesus, where is it that you were leading me and what is the next step for my own life? And then he turns and writes, but have you ever felt there was something you wanted or something you were missing or something you needed to do, but did not know how? Have you ever had a sense that there ought to be more to being a member of a church than just attending worship and making a pledge and sitting on a committee? And he said, whatever your religious background may be, if it's your first time in a church or your thousand and first time in a church, there's always something more. There's always further in and deeper in our pathway of discipleship. And wherever the path of our lives is leading, we remember Jesus say, follow me to the first disciples. And when we hear that, there ought to be an inner tug within us to rise up and follow him too. And when we know where we're going, it makes a huge difference in how we get there. That's the invitation. The simple passage of Jesus saying to disciples, follow me, is the invitation that we hear today as we hear this gospel lesson. And I don't know all the places that Jesus will take you if you commit yourself anew to follow him. I know that all of us will be called to love God with all of our heart and all of our mind, all of our soul and all of our strength. And we're called to love our neighbors as God loves them. And if all of that is true, what is the next step for you in following Jesus? What's the next decision you can make in your life that would move you one step away from simply admiring the work of Christ and actually imitating it? The ongoing faith journey in which we look and act a little more like Jesus each day and each week, each month and each year. What's the next step you can take in your worship life? The next step you can take in your prayer life? The next step you can take in your service? the next step you can take in your generosity. I think we'll find while none of our lives may show that radical discipleship that people like Clarence Jordan and other true prophets show, Jesus calls us nonetheless. And simply being willing to get up and follow in Jesus' footsteps, that next step will do just as much, not just to change your life, but it begins to change this community 
and change this world. Jesus calls us. Come and follow me.